Hi everyone. Welcome to today's Silver White Show webinar. This uh, the, uh, today's topic is uh, Advanced Windows 8 Metro and will be delivered by um, Silver White Show's most appreciated webinar presenter Jill Clearin. This webinar is part one of a two-part webinar session. Join us for part two next Wednesday at exactly the same time. Um, just have in mind you have to subscribe separately for uh, next week's uh, session so you will not be automatically subscribed subscribed for uh, that session so as usual um, this live session will continue for about um, 60 minutes and we'll have a short 10 minute Q&A at the end if you have any questions during the webinar feel free to address them uh, your, during uh, the webinar using the chat option in your webinar panel and we'll have as many questions as possible replied uh, during the Q&A. We'll also have some uh, free ebook giveaways, uh, which Jill will mention. So that's it on my end for now. Jill, I'll give you the word. Okay, thank you Svetla. Good evening everyone and welcome to another uh, webinar on uh, Windows Runtime or WinRT or in general some Windows 8 development. So this webinar uh, I have titled it Advanced WinRT. Um, so let's say that this is going to be the session that takes that positions itself after you've seen all the introductionary stuff um, after, you, after you've seen uh, quite a few sessions on build and now you are um, asking yourself a lot of questions on what uh, what I have to do, what do I have to learn in terms of uh, becoming a Windows 8 uh, developer. So this, the level is about uh, 300 um, so it's not a level 400 yet, uh, although it says advanced, I don't think the time is, is, uh, is it's ripe yet for doing a level 400. So it's going to be uh, around a level 300 uh, talk. So um, there we go. So my name is uh, Gilles Kleren. I'm a .NET architect uh, working at uh, Ordina uh, in Belgium. Uh, I, I focus on um, on XAML development. So I've done a lot of Silverlight, a lot of WPF, uh, and now focusing on Windows Phone and other XAML technologies, of course. I'm a Silverlight MVP and a Telerik MVP and a regional director. and um, I've written a couple of books uh, on XAML technologies, so Silverlight. Um, you see my blog, my email, and my Twitter over there. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to send me a mail afterwards. Or follow me on Twitter or ask me anything on Twitter. That might even go uh, quicker to get a response. So my, uh, my second book that I've uh, written uh, is, uh, is available. It, is, uh, it was released last April. And it's called Silverlight 5 Data and Services Cookbook. Uh, it focuses on Silverlight 5, uh, which is quite uh, logical uh, following the title. Uh, however, it also uh, talks about Windows Phone and many things that are in there, um, like uh, data binding, like MVVM, um, like accessing services, they are applicable on uh, Windows 8 development as well. So a lot of the information that, in, that is inside of uh, this uh, second book, which is about 700 pages, uh, can be used uh, in your Windows 8 endeavors as well. So uh, please take a look at bit.ly slash sl5 data and services uh, to find out some more information about my book. The good news is that you also can win stuff, like Svetla mentioned in the beginning. Um, you can uh, win some ebooks uh, from Silverlight Show uh, if you complete the post-webinar uh, survey that will be sent to you after the webinar. And you can also win an ebook version of my book by tweeting about this uh, webinar using the hashtag web, webinar silverlight show. Uh, then you can win uh, a copy of my ebook and you can find out for yourself what is in there and uh, how you can apply it to your Windows 8 work as well. Finally, uh, so uh, questions, uh, if you have any about the topics that we will be talking about today, um, please uh, enter them via the Q&A window and uh, we will be recording this uh, webinar and a link of the video will be sent to you after uh, the webinar has finished uh, so that's probably something for tomorrow. Um, please if you have any questions regarding the topics uh, focus on the topics that we are talking about today not the topics that we will be talking about uh, next week. So what are we going to talk about today. Uh, so it will depend a bit how far we'll get. I've put in a number of topics um, and uh, we'll see if we finish them all. Otherwise uh, what we haven't talked about today we'll move on to next week. 
So first we'll talk a bit about some advanced stuff with uh, tiles. Uh, I'll be talking about periodic tile updates and uh, push notifications. I've already discussed a bit push notifications. We're going to um, discuss them a bit uh, in more detail. Then there is a large topic, as you can see, on data and services in general, which is a bit of uh, a bit of my favorite topics. Eh? I've written an entire book on it, so I thought it was uh, cool to talk a bit about uh, data and services in relation to Windows 8 uh, development, so WinRT development. So more specifically, we are going to be talking about uh, data binding. Uh, using data controls, which um, I'm not going to talk about how you can use list view or grid view. I assume you already are familiar with that. We're going to take a look at doing semantic zoom uh, in an okay manner because semantic zoom tends to be a bit complex for people. And uh, I'm also going to show you a bit on grid view loading on demand. We're going to also take a look at working with OData. Um, is it possible to work with OData in Windows 8? Uh, and if so, how is it going to be possible? Of course it's going to be possible, otherwise we wouldn't be including it here. Uh, we're also going to talk a bit about downloading stuff, uh, downloading stuff in the background. Um, I'm going to also discuss a bit how you can work with services. Um, we're going to take a look at WCF services, ASMX services, REST services, as well as how we communicate, so through which protocols being JSON or being XML. And we're going to finish off that part by taking a look at um, the live SDK services. So integrating uh, the live uh, service calls, so calls to, uh, for example, your SkyDrive, uh, including them from within your application. So, and if we have time, uh, we'll talk about localization as well. If not, uh, we'll move that one to next week's webinar. And talking about next week's webinar, this is the top, these are some of the topics that we'll be uh, discussing next week. So, I'll be diving a bit deeper in uh, async development. Uh, how can you do async? What exactly is async? You've seen the await keyword. What does it do? Many people tend to be confused, but it does. Well, I'm, I'm going to give you a very easy way of working with uh, async. We're also going to talk a bit about working with files. That tends to be a topic that confuses people as well because of the, um, well, not so logical way of working with data. Uh, so what options do we have with files as well as with data? We'll take a look at building reusable components in WinRT. So a component that you can build in, in C Sharp and use it from JavaScript uh, Windows 8 applications. We're also going to do a deep discussion on background tasks and lock screen uh, applications. That's going to be a, diff, uh, a, a deep dive as well. Uh, I have some cool tricks and we'll probably have some more topics depending on where we get today. Okay, so that are the topics for next week. But we are Wednesday the 18th of July, so we're going to talk about part one. And so. Um, First, we're going to talk a bit about tiles, and more specifically, I'm going to start with periodic tiles. We've done an entire webinar on uh, tiles. Um, now, there are a couple of things that um, are a bit beyond what we've talked about um, in that webinar. In that webinar, we've, we've seen the, the several types of uh, tiles. Um, we've, uh, we've seen how a tile can be updated locally through a, a call from, from within your code, from within your Windows 8 application. That can only, of course, be used when you are running, when the user is running your application. Um, and it's basically not useful if you want to do uh, an out-of-band update. So basically, if you want to do an update when the application isn't running, hasn't been started. Um, so it's not really, it can be useful, but it's not always useful. Then you also had, we talked about that, scheduled updates, uh, where we update uh, the tile at a specific time, also from code. Um, now, in many cases, uh, you will want to update your tile without the user having to run your application. Or maybe uh, the device has been rebooted, and so the user hasn't restarted your application yet, and so you still want to update the user via a tile, which is, of course, the perfect scenario for a tile. Now, there are other ways of updating those tiles, and uh, the first one is a periodic update. The second one will be push notifications, and we're going to discuss push notifications in a bit more detail in just a second. Let us first take a look at periodic updates. Now, the main difference between um, periodic updates and push notifications is that a periodic tile update is a pull system, whereas a push notification, like the word says, 
is a push notification. It, it will be pushed to your device from the cloud. Now, what exactly is then a periodic tile update? Well, how is the tile going to update itself through a pull system? Well, as the first si uh, sentence says there, it is a poor man's live tile. It is very easy to set up. It only requires you a service that returns some XML. So it can be any service, uh, a WCF service or an ASMX service, that publishes some XML and your periodic tile can then do, on the user's device, a poll from that XML. So it's basically going to get an, an address that is going to poll every now and then, and so the XML that's being returned is going to be shown in the tile. We've talked about in the tile webinar about how this is useful, um, uh, sorry, how the uh, tile updates are going to be sent. They are, it's a template system, so it's exactly that XML, that XML template uh, that is going to be returned from that service. It is really easy to set up and it's an easy way to distribute updates with a large uh, audience. It's very easy to set up, as I mentioned. It's a service that returns an XML string and in your application you are going to add a um, tile and you're going to pass to that tile a URI that is going to be polled for new updates. You call the tile updater dot start periodic update which is going to be passed in the URI. Um, you, pa you call that with every start of the application just like a push notification, you register uh, for uh, doing that pulling system, uh, uh, pulling system because otherwise it will stop after a certain amount of time. If the service is not available at poll time, Windows will just let go of that poll and it will retry after the specified amount of time. We as developers will specify how many times uh, the polling has to be done. The, the application in fact, doesn't need to be anything. Not need to do anything special. The only thing it needs to do is specify that it needs the internet capability. Uh, so, in the capabilities, you need to mark that it will be uh, going online. It doesn't support, however, uh, tile queuing. So, update queuing. So that means that you can only do one poll, get back XML, and the previous one will be gone. In regular tiles, and also with push notifications, you can queue five updates. Uh, this is not possible with periodic tile updates. And it is not something that is useful for every scenario. It is not useful if you want to distribute through periodic tile updates some breaking news. Because, um, if I'm not mistaken, the smallest amount of um, update interval is 30 minutes. You want to update more regularly if you have uh, breaking news. Preferably, you want to push information to the client. This is really useful, for example, for a weather application. You don't really need to push weather uh, updates. You're going to pull them every half, half an hour, for example. Okay, let's take a look at the first demo. <clears throat> so we're going to start up Visual Studio 2012. It is the RC edition, the release candidate. All the demos that you will be a bit, uh, able to download afterwards uh, are going to be um, RC uh, uh, capable as well. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to run the application and show you how it works. So in this case, I've made it really easy. The, what, what I'm doing here is I am going to call onto an XML file. Basically, this is the response being returned by a service. So if we paste this in a browser, there we go. This is the response. I hope you can read it. Let me enlarge it a bit. This is the response coming back from the service. It is XML. In this case, it is going to be a tile-wide text or tree, which is the name of the template that we're going to update, and the content of it is going to be Hello World. Okay. So, let's go back to the application. Here I'm specifying how many updates I want. For example, I want to do a half an hour update, and I can start polling. Now, let's take a look at the tile, and here we go. This is the product tile update was, that was returned by the service. If we open it, we arrive back in the application. So, that XML is now being captured by the application. Uh, it is polling every half an hour. So, if I change the XML online, we are going to update it. Uh, it is going to be visible in a half an hour. Let's close the application. Let's take a look at the code. 
So when I clicked on the start, start polling button, what we had is we are going to build up a periodic update recurrence. That's what you see here. I'm going to get that from the combo box. Then through the tile update manager, create tile updater for application, which is what you always do. And then you say start periodic update. So here you specify that every instance of periodic update recurrence, we are going to pull the past in URI. And automatically the tile is going to be, the tile polling is going to be scheduled by Windows and every um, 30 minutes or so is going to download the XML from the service. It's a very easy system to work with, that's the only thing that you actually have to do to make it work. Now, as mentioned, periodic tile updates aren't always going to be your savior. They are okay for like better applications, but they aren't okay uh, for breaking news. If you want to do breaking news, you need push notifications. You need to update the user as, as fast as you can by sending XML to the user. So push notifications are like the missing link. You want to send information without doing a polling, without overloading the service because we, uh, if we would do polling every half a minute or so, you'll probably get too much load on the server. So that's not a good idea. So in that case, push notifications are a better solution. Now how do they work? Push notifications are being sent from the cloud through something called the push notification service and um, basically the whole mechanism is called WNS, the Windows Notification Service. What it will do is it will always it will allow you as a as a, a Windows 8 application to receive XML in the form of a template being sent from a service in the cloud and that is PNS that uh, the push notification service. Your application will register with us your service. Your service, when something happens on the, uh, or something needs to be sent to the client, will push an information to Windows Azure, and Azure will take care of making sure that all the devices that have been registered for that push notification service will, inf will in fact, um, receive it. People may be worried about what is this, this going to cost me? Well, it's going to cost you nothing because the entire system is free. You don't have to worry about paying Microsoft for sending push notifications. It's entirely cloud-based, so it's completely scalable, and it's uh, also free for your application to use. For the developer, it's completely transparent. You don't have to worry about how the device is going to be physically located, and it's all handled by Microsoft. So this is uh, a, an architectural slide. I've shown this one, I think, in the push notification, uh, sorry, in the tile uh, webinar as well. So I'm going to go very quickly over it. So this is, on the left, you have your Windows 8 application. That application wants to receive push notifications. So what it's going to do, it is going to register with, the, with something called a notification client platform, which is a uh, part of Windows on the client. And your application is going to get from that metro, uh, sorry, from that notification client platform, something called a channel URI. And a channel URI is a unique identifier for your application on a particular device for a specific user. It is like the permission slip for the application to be able to receive updates, uh, push notifications. So your application, that is step one, ask the notification client platform to, uh, for that permission slip and it will receive a channel URI. That channel URI you need to set to some server infrastructure. That channel URI is basically the ID of the app on a device. Your cloud service needs to register that somewhere, eventually with some parameters. It is basically your system on the server side that says, well, this is an ID of a, of a device that I need to update. The red blocks are the blocks that you need to write, so you need to write that, you need to write the storing for that uh, channel URI, and then some third party, some backend service wants to notify all the clients, so it is going to notify 
the cloud service on the right, and that cloud service is now going to look in its database of channel URIs and send an update through a post to the Windows notification service, and that is hosted in Azure. You don't have to worry about how this thing works. It gets the ID of the, the client that it needs to update and also the post, uh, the posting, uh, the push notification, the XML, the, the template again. And then the Windows notification service is going to take care that the client will actually get the update by sending the XML to the notification client platform on the client side. And that will take care that the application, your application, will get that information. So you only need to worry about storing those channel URIs on the service side, as well as making sure that you will be able to do a post message to the Windows notification service. If you need to set this up entirely, as mentioned, the red block here, you need to build that yourself. You can do this entirely in Azure, because what you need is the ability to write a service that accepts channel URIs that stores them somewhere, and then calls on to the Windows notification service. Everything that you need for that is available in Windows Azure. So if you're considering setting this up, take a look at what Windows Azure has to offer, because it will be a perfect fit for this. OK. Let's run this. Uh, let's take a look at a demo. Let's take a look at some code. So let's going to take a look at push notifications. There we go. And the second application, whoops. <clears throat> so I'm going to be simulating uh, the sending of push notifications um, by building, uh, I have a, a client application that is basically your server site. So um, if you want to enable this, you need to go, and it is on the slides here, I think, somewhere, yeah, there we go. You need to register your application through manage.dev.live.com and there you have a link to say I'm going to build a Windows 8 Metro style app. From there you will get some IDs and in your application, this is my application, in the packaging you get an, a package name back from manage.dev.live.com you need to enter that here. That is how your application will know where, uh, sorry, how Windows Notification Service will know which application it needs to update. Because you're do, not doing it through the store. If it was done through the store, it's different. Okay. So, um, what am I going to do is I'm going to first run the uh, client application. This is a WPF app that allows me to send the um, notification. So what we can send is a push, uh, sorry, a toast notification, a batch, and a tile update. And we're going to try a, um, we're going to try a toast notification. So now I'm going to start the Windows 8 application. There we go. Very nice UI, as you can see here. So now I'm going to do the first step. My application is going to request with Windows, with the notification client platform, that channel URI. There we go. As you can hopefully see, I can't enlarge it because then the webinar thing uh, starts uh, flipping. Um, this URI is the permission slip for my app to receive um, push notifications. We're going to go back to here. So this is now this URI. So imagine that my application has now sent this to the server side where it is being stored in a database. Now I am going to use a client secret, and that client secret is being returned to me via the manager.lab.lab.com, and it is basically the authentication for my app to, for my server side basically, to register with uh, or, or being able to send the post to uh, Windows Azure. And now, take a look what happens. Let's try. So I'm going to send a toast notification here. Notify. I'm going to hit a breakpoint probably. There we go. Skip this one. Whoops, something went from, uh, didn't. Oh, we are unauthorized. That's not good. That shouldn't have happened. I hope I took the correct one. Oh, sorry for that. I took the wrong file, I assume. Let's try that again. Um, we need this one. 
Okay, there we go. I took the wrong file. Sorry for that. And then, of course, we are not going to be able to use it. Let's try it one more time. Say notify. There we go. Now we see the touch notification coming in. And we can do this in the exact same way with a tile and a batch update. Okay, now let's take a look at what happens here. So this, uh, let's first take a look at the Windows 8 app. This was what I wanted to open. Let's close that down. The application is extremely simple. The only thing that it does, it is asking Windows for a notification, uh, for, sorry, for a channel URI. And that is what you see here. Through the call, Windows Networking Push Notifications, Push Notification Channel Manager. Create Push Notification Channel for Application, async, because it can take a couple of milliseconds. It will return you a channel, uh, sorry, it will return you a channel URI. That channel URI you need to send to your server and that needs to store it. Eventually with some parameters about what the user wants to receive. Then your server site, which is in this case the WPF application, well, what it needs to do, it needs to send a notification. And that, that notification is XML, the same template XML as you saw before. It can be a batch update, it can be a tile update, and it can be a toast update. It is pure text that you are going to send. How are you going to send that? Well, you are going to do a post to a, uh, sorry, here it is. You are going to do a web request dot create to the channel URI, the subscription URI. You're going to do a post of that XML, passing in some specific X, uh, headers. And what are you going to send? Well, in this case, we are going to send the notification content. That's what you see here. It's going to be sent as a byte array. And then we do this uh, two lines of code, which are actually going to build up the request stream. And then we, to that request stream, we are going to write the message. And then we get back a response, with, which should be uh, an OK message. And that's how we can send an XML update to millions of clients that have been connected. It is completely scalable for us. All right. Let's close this thing down. And let's go back to the slides. And let's. This one can go as well. There we go. And let us now go to the data block of this presentation. All right. Let's talk a bit about data. The topic that comes to mind immediately when thinking about data in Windows 8 is, of course, data binding. Data binding is probably the most interesting and the most uh, fun feature to use in the entire XAML stack in WPF and Silverlight. In W in uh, Windows 8 match to applications, data binding is, luckily for us, also supported. Now, it is not, however, a full data binding stack as we had in Silverlight that is supported. No, not everything is supported. Now, what is supported and what isn't? This is a list of the things that I know that are supported. I think I've covered them all. I might have forgotten something. So, what is supported? The data binding syntax, that's what I mean with regular data binding. Element binding, so binding two UI elements. A converter, the model binding, so that's basically using the data context. Indexers, data templates, a collection view source, using the notification system, so the, uh, um, the iNotify property changed and the I collection, uh, iNotify collection changed. Uh, binding to a responsible service. And exceptions, but only in the output window. If you think back of what we had with Silverlight 5, this is a step back, um, to say the least. Um, so that means that a lot of features that we have, if you've done some Silverlight 5 or 4 development, we, ha we are missing. Uh, things like the string format, the fallback value, things that have been de uh, uh, declared or, or, or that were available on the binding base, they have been removed. There is no ability to build a custom markup extension in Windows 8. There is no way of doing implicit data templating. There is no way of putting a breakpoint in a data binding statement in XAML, which is a pity. Uh, so there are more things that aren't supported. Basically, the data binding system in Silverlight, uh, sorry, in Metro, is currently at the level of Silverlight 3. That means a lot of features that you've come to love in, from Silverlight 4 and 5 have been removed. 
or basically aren't there yet, I should say it, I should say it like that. Let us quickly spend some time at looking at some data binding uh, in action in Silverlight. There I go again in Windows 8. Um, so I have here a sample that basically contains about everything uh, that is available in data binding in Metro. There we go. Let's run this thing. So what do we have? We have the ability to do element binding. So in this case I have a list box and as you can see there at the bottom I am binding to the selected element. If you take a look at the code that is element binding, that is nothing new. Uh, you should know this if you've done some other XAML development. So this text block here is getting its text from an other element called main list box and it is binding to selected item. That's element binding. Object binding, well that's very simple. That is basically using the item source or set in the data context. Um, the observable collection. So being notified about collection changes still works. So in here I'm binding to an observable collection. I add uh, elements to that observable collection and it starts adding them. And we automatically see them appearing. So the observable collection binding in here in this code behind, I have here a observable collection of person instances and I'm adding persons here. I'm setting it as a data context for list box, but when I click on the add person button, I'm adding instances to that person's observable collection and you automatically saw them appearing in the UI. So that works. Also, the notify property changed thing works as well. So here we have a data context currently set to, set to uh, a person that is not uh, defined yet. If we change that person, you see that the updates have uh, so that the uh, UI is updating itself because of the notify property changed. I'm binding to a person called change, or oh, sorry, a type of uh, named changeable person which implements the unnotify property changed everything that's, ten, that's standing here, you should know. Um, in the UI, uh, sorry, in the code behind for the uh, application, I'm simply saying this data context is person uh, and I'm, bind, I'm updating that person in code and automatically those changes are reflected in the UI. Converters, they still work. Uh, so here we have a, um, a slider and we have a text box here and there is a um, converter sitting behind this that when you scroll the slider uh, it is going to update this to a converter. The converter is sitting in here which is still a class that implements the iValue converter interface and still has the convert and the convert back. The convert is getting in the value as an object which is then going to be passed uh, in this case to an integer or a cost yeah, cast into an integer and then I'm going to uh, update that value and I'm going to return that and in my um, application that is converters, that's this one, I am uh, using this converter on this text as you can see here, I'm using the converter which was uh, declared as great converter instance through XAML. And we almost have them all. The data templates, they are still there as well. So in here you can see that we have a data template specified on a list box. That is still available as well. So data templating, as we as you can see here we have a list box which has an item template which has a data which, which is def declared as a data template. In this case it is just a border which is binding to a color and the text block is binding to name and that is in this case of a team and that has uh, should have a color and I think it's this one there we go. So uh, we have the name, the city and the color and that's what we are binding to. All right. So those things are the typical things that work, that worked in WPF, that worked in Silverlight and those are in the terms of data binding the things that we will have to work with uh, in uh, WinRT at this point. Something that is new in WinRT is the ability to bind to anonymous types. It was not supported in Windows, uh, sorry in Silverlight uh, to bind to anonymous type that didn't work, that uh, caused a crash. In uh, Windows 8, this is however supported. This is possible to do a binding to anonymous types. So uh, instead of looking at a slide, 
Let's take a look at the code for that. Um, I still have the app open, I hope, yeah, there we go. So I'm going to bind to anonymous types. Of course, uh, visually this is not very uh, good to look at. So as you can see here, we only have um, two items in that list box and those are the ones that have the word red in the name. Let's close this thing down and let's take a look at the code. Anonymous binding. So what I've done here, so I have a uh, instance of Teams declared. Teams is a class that inherits from list of team and those teams have been added in there. I'm doing a link query on that where I'm saying return me all the teams that con where the name contains red and put them into a new and there you see the anonymous type appearing team name, team CTM, team color. I'm setting the data context to that results and in the UI notice what we're using here team color and team name which are properties on the anonymous type. This would not have worked in Silverlight and uh, as far as I know it would not have worked in WPF uh, either. I'm not really sure about that. It, in any case, it works in Metro, it works in WinRT. Alright, let's close this one down and let's move on. Now binding to controls. If you've taken a look at Windows 8, you've probably seen the list controls. Um, available and eh? so uh, there are quite a few new list controls available in Silverlight uh, in, Win in uh, Windows 8. So um, those are the list view for vertical scrolling, the grid view for horizontal scrolling, the flip view to scroll through items or flip through items and the semantic zoom control. I'm not going to spend time on showing you what these are. I assume you already know that um, but we're going to take a look at some um, specific things uh, for these controls. The first thing is loading on demand. Loading on demand is something that is possible in the grid view. The grid view loads all the data that you give it. So for example, if you do a query to Flickr, Flickr will return you an XML file and you're going to read that in to show some uh, images to the user. It's going to build up uh, all the hundred um, images. Basically it, what it's going to do, it's going to do that virtualized, so it's going to build up only those that have been, that are in view and a few extras, but for the rest it's not going to do anything else. It is going to get in the entire response and it's going to visualize that. The grid view is made to support large sets of data, however if you are going to do a service call and that service call returns you 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 um, instances, items of, of whatever that you want to visualize, it is going to be bad for your server. Uh, you don't want to load those in one go, you want to load those on demand. Basically what you want is you only want to load items when the grid view is, when the user story is at the end of the grid view or closing uh, to the end of the grid view as possible in Windows 8. The grid view, apart from being virtualized by default, also allows you to do loading on demand. Let's take a look at the demo for that. So what I've done here in this demo, loading on demand, uh, grid view load on demand, this one, I have um, built a inf an, 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 a service that always returns 50 new responses. So basically it's um, limitless, it, it keeps on returning responses and I want to visualize that in a grid view. So I'm going to build, I'm going to start the service already. Um, debug start new instance, there we go. So I'm going to start the service and it has a method that always returns 50 random numbers between 0 and 10,000 if I'm not mistaken. Okay. And now I'm going to build, I'm going to run the application. There we go. And if things work out fine, there we go. You see that it builds up the grid view. First it had 50, it did a second call for 50. Notice, I hope you can see it at the bottom, notice what happens with the slider at the bottom. So now it loaded uh, probably about 100, maybe 150. We're going to start scrolling and notice what happens. The scroll bar, uh, the 
keeps getting smaller because I'm basically loading an M, uh, a, a, a list of, of, of data that never stops loading, but it keeps on sending requests whenever I'm approaching the end of the, of the grid view. It loads 50 new items with every call. This is basically an, uh, a limitless uh, uh, grid view. It will never reach its end because the service will keep on loading new data. Notice what happens when I, uh, when I select one. You see it uh, flying out of the screen immediately. In terms of memory, I assume this is not very good to do, but anyway. Now let's take a look at, uh, so the service, uh, for the people who don't believe me, uh, the service is always returning 50 new um, numbers and returning those in a list. That's it. The survey, uh, sorry, the Windows 8 Metro application simply has a grid view, as you can see here, and it is going to load new items uh, on the fly. It is going to load new items when it is approaching the end. So in code, we have bound to something called a new incremental source. That incremental source is sitting in here. Then you have the incremental source. I'm not going to go through all the code here, but this one has a load more items async method. And in that load more items async, we are going to um, load new items um, into the grid queue, and it's automatically going to push those into the grid queue as well. Basically, you can think of it as being an observable collection that gets new items every uh, time that you approach the end of the uh, grid queue. In the, uh, here it is, here we are using the get page and the get page is being called from here, from the asynchronous loading of more items, which is saying, get me some new data, get me some new data, uh, whoops, this one, and in here I am calling my number service, which returns me 50 new items, and I'm passing those back into a response, being uh, returned as a task of I page response of string, which is in this case um, the list of items being returned from the service. And that way I am capable of limiting the amount of initial data being returned from my service, putting less load on the service, and also gi oh, still giving the user a good experience uh, when scrolling through the um, grid view. So not only do you get good uh, or better performance of your service, less load on your service, you also get, um, you still get the same good performance on your Windows 8 application. <coughs> okay, now let's take a look at Semantic Zoom. Semantic Zoom is the cool thing that you see here in your start screen. This is Semantic Zoom for the people who have never seen it. Semantic Zoom allows you to do, or to view, a grid from two um, viewpoints. You have the default view, which is your zoomed in view, which is normally your default view of your data, and then you have a zoomed out mode. And that zoomed out mode is a high level view of your data. It allows you to view your data differently, perhaps grouped. It is very handy, it comes in very handy when you have a horizontal scrolling uh, grid view that contains quite a lot of data, and instead of forcing the user to go all the way to the right, it allows you to zoom out and go to the far right much faster, or in general, find the block of data that you want much faster. You can do it using pinch and stretch, but you can also do it with the mouse uh, using the uh, control key and the mouse wheel up and down. That's possible to use the uh, semantic zoom. Now, let's take a look at how Semantic Zoom really works. So I have a few screenshots here. There we go. Um, oh, sorry, uh, this, I forgot this slide. Now, um, what, the, what has to be in the Semantic Zoom control? Well, you see some code down there. Uh, it has a zoomed out view and a zoomed in view. And inside of it, in e both of these, we can put a, uh, something that implements the iSemantic Zoom control. It can be basically a list view or a grid view. Most of the time, it's two grid views. However, it can be two list views as well. So these are some samples that I took from the MSDN website where Microsoft has put up some 
cool samples of how semantic zoom can be used. Uh, so here you have on the uh, down on the bottom right, you see uh, your zoomed out view, and when you zoom in, you see for all of these categories some extra um, subcategories. Here you see if, uh, a view of your email inbox, per, uh, for example. You see that uh, on the zoomed out view, which is now at the top left, uh, how many messages you had, and when you zoom in, you automatically go to the uh, messages you want. For if you would have clicked on the 78 for last month, the grid view would align itself so that it shows you the last month uh, as the first thing you see. Some other examples. There we go. Now let's take a look at semantic zoom, our, uh, how we can do it ourselves. Well, let's take a look at the semantic zoom uh, demo. <clears throat> now, semantic zoom, the, the reason I included it here because it is not always that simple to do. Um, it, it asks quite a lot of XAML and it also um, you need to do quite a few things to actually get it to work. Let's take a look. What you see here is a uh, list box, uh, sorry, a grid view. This is the zoomed in view. When I now do control mouse um, up, um, I am going to go to my zoomed out view. This is my high level view of my data. I zoom in again. There we go. And I'm automatically brought back to the zoomed in view. If you have a lot of data and you click on one of these, so it will automatically align itself to the thing that you see here. It's also possible to switch views um, via code. That's possible as well. All right. Let us take a look at the code for this thing to work. First, let's take a look at the data. So in this uh, sample here, we have a class called, or being the view model, and it contains a list of movie categories called movie categories. A movie category has a list of movies. That way of um, showing your data or grouping your data is very important. If you think of the grid uh, semantic zoom, it is basically a list of lists. It's a group. It's a grouped grid view basically, yeah. um, and it is two grid views that have been bound to the same data, and internally the control knows which high-level item is um, is linked with each low level item. So each zoomed out item is linked with each zoomed in item. So in this case, a movie category is going to be the zoomed out view and each movie category has a list of movies and that is the data that is going to be shown in the zoomed in view. For that to work, we, we get our data in, in here hard coded. For that to work, we need to make our uh, data so that it is workable for the control. In here, what I'm going to do is I have my movies and I'm going to be, uh, b uh, do a uh, group by on it, uh, so a, a link query, where I'm going to do a group by and I'm going to create a list of movie categories. And remember what I said, it is a list of lists, so each movie category has a list of movies, so we have a list of movie categories where each movie category has a list of movies. And that data is a perfect fit for a semantic zoom control. Let's now take a look at the semantic zoom control itself. We start here by having a collection view source. You can do without a collection view source, but it's an easy way of working with it. And it is bound to movie categories on the uh, view model. The items path is set to movies. Okay. Let's take a look at the semantic zoom control. Quite annoyingly, I cannot do the collapse for, uh, for a reason that seems to be a bug in Visual Studio. Let's try closing it. Sometimes it helps when I type some. Yeah, there we go. So, if we take a look at the semantic zoom control, it has a zoomed in view and a zoomed out view. The zoomed in view is the default view of my data. So, that is a grid view that is uh, getting its items from the grouped items view source. That's the one that we saw here at the top. It has items tempered. The items panel itself is a virtualizing stack panel, which is basically saying how the 
how the groups are going to be shown. And on each individual group, the header is in this case a button. And the uh, panel for each of the items is a variable sized wrap grid. So that's really nothing special going on. It is simply a group grid view where we have bound groups to the grid view. And it is a group of uh, movie categories with lists of movies in there. Let's take a look at the zoomed out view. The zoomed out view in this case is a list view. In the slides we said everything that implements the isometric zoom interface can be placed in there. So the uh, list view has an item template which is in this case simply a text block which is binding itself to group category name. If we take a look back at the main page view model we see here that category name. And then we have an item container style and basically that's it. Now notice one thing is missing here. In fact, it is not really missing, it is a bit of a bug in the control. We need to manually specify what is going to be the item source for the zoomed out view. That we need to do manually ourselves. As you can see here, what I'm doing here is I'm asking the collection view source which are your collection groups. Basically, which, which are your list of lists, the outer lists, that is. And then, the semantic zoom control zoomed out view, the item source for that one, so the zoomed out view, I'm binding to those collection groups. So this is something that you need to do manually yourself. It is not um, going through automatically by specifying at the highest level uh, on the semantic zoom control itself what, are the, what is the list of lists. It doesn't do that automatically for you. You need to manually specify how the zoomed out view is going to bind. Uh, for you. Alright. There we go. <clears throat> now what about O data support? Well there is O data support available for Metro. It is um, not really there yet in a sense that it doesn't really offer you everything that uh, was available in Silverlight. Uh, one of the thing that, things that it doesn't do is adding the service reference automatically for you. You need to do that manually to the data SVC util. Now, instead of talking about it, let's take a look at OData support in Windows 8. Now, if you've never done some OData, so OData is basically allowing you to expose your model through um, a service. And that service is of type a WCF data service. So WCF data service is the way of building OData endpoints. Now, the people of Netflix, they have exposed their entire model through a WCF data service. And it is possible to form a, a Metro application to consume that service. Now, OData has its um, particularities. It is not always that easy to work with. There are a few things that you need to understand. Let's first run the sample and let's hit the breakpoint here. So if you've never done some WCF, uh, sorry, some O data, basically what happens? We are going to call onto a RESTful endpoint, and we are going to get XML from that endpoint. Now the client library for Metro applications in this case, it is going to um, abstract away the need to build up that URI ourselves and the response return, returns from the service as XML is going to be automatically materialized into objects. That's what the client library does. That's what the client library did in Silverlight. That's what it also does in Metro. So, I'm going to asynchronously call on to Netflix now and look what happens. So basically, we are now using a link query. We are going to ask um, Netflix, give me back all the jars uh, where the name contains sci-fi. Notice what we're doing here. We are doing this in a link query. We are, this link query through a link provider is basically translated into a real query. Uh, sorry, a real URI. That's what you see here. That URI is the URI that we are going to communicate with. If we paste that into a browser, that is a huge response that we get here. Uh, uh, so this is now uh, not what I wanted. So um, 
I'm not going to try disabling this, but this is the response, an XML response coming back from my server. Instead of building up that query uh, that I just pasted in here, instead of building up this query, I simply could do that with link. That is done through the client library. What the client library also does, it is going to, there we go, it is now getting back XML. And that XML is also going to be automatically translated into objects. And those objects you see in here. And for all of these objects, I'm going to do something else. Notice that we are doing this um, asynchronously. So now I'm going. Uh, so here we did this And now for each of these jars, I'm going to download an image from uh, Lampfix as well. And there we get some jars. There we go. We get some jars, and we can click on it, and we can dig through uh, in the sample. It's always going to be the same thing. The client library works in Metro. So basically, if you have any uh, WCF data services or data uh, endpoints available today, you can work with them from Metro applications. All right, let us take a look at background transfers. Now, you all know by now that Metro is built such that uh, it allows you to build, uh, sorry, to run one application at a time. Unless you do, or uh, you use SnapView as a user, then you have two applications on the same screen. Every application that isn't running is being suspended. Being suspended means that it cannot access the CPU, that it cannot access the network, that it cannot access the disk any longer. Now, for some applications who are doing downloading of stuff, this might be an annoying thing. Because um, if we do this, um, if we want to download stuff, the application to, while we are downloading needs to remain the, on, the, the main application. We cannot simply put it uh, in suspended mode because then the download is going to be uh, suspended as well. So if your application needs to download stuff, using the default uh, HTTP client, for example, is not going to be a good idea because it will be suspended when the application is being suspended. However, there is something called the background downloader. And the background downloader lives in the Windows networking background transfer. And it allows you to create something called download operations. And if you've done some Windows Phone development, this is very similar. Um, it is basically allowing you as a developer to, in, to create a download and register that download with an external process called the background transfer host. It's an executable that will be instantiated for a download to do in the background, running through um, uh, or, or let's say that it's not being killed when the application is going to be killed. So if the application is being uh, shut down, your background download will still be happening even if your application isn't the main application any longer. It supports credentials, it supports custom headers, and it also supports progress uh, reporting. But this is very interesting to use in applications where you want to allow the user, for example, to download a movie file. But instead of having him to wait while that movie file is being downloaded, we can, we can do something else and the download will happen uh, for him in the background. Now, let's take a look at how this works. Um, let's go here and let's take a look at background transfers, this one. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to search for the big bug bunny because that's quite a large file. That's an open source video file, Big Bang Bunny. And I'm going to download, I'm going to get a download link. So this is, uh, this should work, let's try that one. Copy the shortcut. So this is a large file that from within my Windows Metro style app I would like to download. So let's try that. So I'm going to remove this. I'm going to paste that in. I think it's an AVI file, so I'm going to put that in. I'm going to start the download. There we go. And notice what happens. It is now downloading the file. If we take a look at the um, task manager, we will see here, this is the Windows 8 Metro style app here at the top. And the background has a background transfer host downloading my application. Even if I close my app, 
we go, closing the app, the download is still continuing. Yep. The application hasn't been shut down at it, uh, either, but uh, let's, let's put it like this. That will, of course, kill it entirely because it's instantiated from Visual Studio. But normally, the download will keep on running um, from within, uh, from outside the application. Um, now, how do we do that? Let's take a look. Uh, let's go to start download. The first thing we need to worry about is where are we going to store the file? First issue. You cannot simply say, and we're going to talk about that next week, we cannot simply say store the file in C My Downloads because my Metro app is not going to be able to access that. Instead, we need to put it either in the application local storage or in the uh, one of the known folders. And in this case, we are doing that in the known folders. In this case, we use the pictures library where we are going to create a file asynchronously, building up a unique name. That returns us an instance of storage file. Then we are instantiating the background downloader and we are creating a download where we are specifying what is going to be the URI that we want to download and what is going to be the storage file where we are going to store it. That is going to be, uh, that's going to be placed in something called a download operation. Now we're going to handle that download asynchronously. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to start that download asynchronously, pass in something called a cancellation token source, and also passing in a progress callback. The progress callback you saw, uh, you see here, and it is basically an asynchronous, uh, uh, sorry, it is a callback that allows me to um, update the progress, down, progress of the download, uh, and that's what you saw happening um, in, the, in the text box that was at the, at, the, at the bottom of the screen. It was updating. This happens in a background thread, so we need to do marshalling back to the UI, which is basically going to do that through a dispatcher run async, which is comparable to the dispatcher begin invoke. I think I've shown you uh, what it does. Yeah, so as you can see, it is allowing me to do asynchronously starting the download. It is now saying to that background transfer host, please download for me this file while the application is or isn't running. So it is recommended to use this downloading um, for downloading from within your application, even if you're not, um, even if you expect the user to be, to remain in your application, because it will simply be easier to work with. Now what can we do in terms of services? Can we do REST services? Can we do ASMX? Well, the good news is, we can do ASMX, we can do WCF, REST uh, using JSON or XML, RSS and sockets. They are all supported. Most of the services that we will build in .NET are WCF services. Now, when we look at WCF and how we can communicate with it from within a, civil, a metro application, it is more or less the same story in terms of what is supported as in Silverlight. It supports services, WCF services, that have uh, a basic HTTP binding, a NAT TCP HTTP binding, a NAT HTTP binding, and a custom binding. So if you want, for example, to do binary encoding, you can use the custom binding. Binding elements you see here on the screen. Encoding, text and binary. Security modes, so transfer, um, transport uh, security is supported. Transport with message credential, transport credential only are supported. Again, the same thing as in Silverlight. Uh, we have covered that in uh, some articles on Silverlight. So if you want to take a look at how you can do that for Metro, it's going to be more or less the same. Serializers, the data contract serializer, data contract JSON serializer, and the XML serializer are available as well. However, at this point, no XML is being, uh, sorry, no configuration code uh, will be generated. So no, X, uh, so no configuration uh, that contains the binding. So you need to do that from uh, code. Uh, in your reference.cs that gets generated, there is a, a partial method called configure endpoint. Uh, if you want to uh, do stuff with your, set, with your um, endpoint, you have to use this partial method. Everything that gets generated is task-based, meaning that everything will use the await async pattern. And in your Metro application, you need to specify the internet capability, of course. 
Let's take a look at how we can use a WCF service. So in this example, I have a WCF service and an ASMX service. Both the WCF and the ASMX service will work through the use of a basic HTTP binding. And in that case, my Metro application can communicate with it. Let's run the application. The first sample is using ASMX. There we go. ASMX. This is a public weather service. Um, and I'm going to uh, enter a zip code of the US. And from my early childhood, I know that there was some um, TV program called Beverly Hills 90210. So that is the post zip code of uh, Beverly Hills. So we're going to load the weather. As you can see here, we have loaded in the weather for Beverly Hills. If there is anyone watching from Beverly Hills, it seems, it seems quite good in Beverly Hills. Okay. Anyway, so how are we communicating with that service? So of course we add a service reference and then I am doing almost the same thing as I would do in Silverlight. As you can see here, I'm asking, oh, so I'm instantiating a client, so in this case it's called the weather soap client, and then I'm doing the get city weather by zip async, which is a method on that service. I'm using that in combination with the await async pattern, and we're going to talk about that next week. And we are getting back a weather return object, and we can pass that. If we want to do the same with WCF, let me quickly start up my WCF service. There we go. And let's go back to the Metro app. It is going to return me some URIs of images. There we go, and we see some images appearing. Super great service, but doesn't doesn't really matter. Uh, oops, that's the REST service. In here, what I'm doing is I am instantiating the image service. Uh, client and I'm doing the get picture IDs async, doing it using the await async pattern. So WCF and ASMX they work in most or in probably the same way as you as, as you, uh, you would do it um, in Silverlight. However, you use the await async pattern to make things easier. If we take a look at REST really quickly, REST is now using the HTTP client instead of the web client. It is also working in an asynchronous way, and it is fully RESTful. So that means that we can use GET, the GET async, PUT, PUT async, POST, POST async, and for DELETE, we use the DELETE async. So it is, a, uh, it is possible to do REST in combination with the HTTP client. The response can be JSON or can be XML, and both can be passed from within a Metro style application. Either you use the JSON object, on which you can use the parse. Uh, you can use on the JSON object the get name string or the get name number, or you can also use the indexer. Uh, uh, alternatively, the data contract JSON serializer, which is available in .NET, is also available in Metro. For XML responses, you can use the XML reader or writer, the XML serializer, or preferably linked to XML. This demo, I am. Um, in this case, we are going to communicate with Flickr. This demo we already did um, in a previous webinar. So I'm going to quickly uh, do a search on Flickr for Belgium. And let's hope I'm not embarrassing myself. So here's now a response coming back from Flickr, um, purely XML, and I'm parsing that uh, in my application. Notice, by the way, that this is fully virtualized. It only loads in the ones that I'm visually looking at. This is virtualization, not the loading on demand, because Flickr has returned me 100 responses. If we take a look at the code, the code is um, instantiating, it is using the HTTP client get async, passing in the URI for the application. I get back after waiting for the response, something called an HTTP response message. I'm going to parse that message. Um, basically, I'm going to say response.content read as string async. That is going to get me the XML. I load that XML into an X document, and I'm going to parse that in uh, through some link to uh, XML code. And that I can then use in my application. All right, sorry for that. <clears throat> 
So the last thing that I'm going to be talking about today, it's going to take two more minutes, is accessing or integrating with the live SDK from within your application. It is possible within a Metro application to integrate with, for example, SkyDrive. Um, there is a specific uh, SDK available called the Live SDK for Metro, which allows you to integrate with um, not only SkyDrive, but in general Live, because most people will in fact log into their uh, Windows 8 device using a Live uh, ID. So using that, you can use a single sign-on with the Live ID from within your application. And you can use that, for example, to access uh, a SkyDrive and the files in the SkyDrive of the user that is using the application. Let's take a look at that in action. Now, the code for this is not really that simple. Um, I'm going to go through it uh, together with you. Uh, at this example here. Because it uses some dynamic uh, in there. That makes things a bit more complicated to work with. However, it's not very difficult. Let's take a look at it. So first, let's run the sample. There we go. <coughs> Okay, so um, now it is basically um, it's doing the authorization. There we go. Um, so it's using classes starting with uh, which have a name that starts with live. So they are available. They are part of the live SDK. So in this case, I'm doing the login. There we go. Waiting for the login to happen. Uh, if we are connected, then we are going to store the session that we get back uh, in the in an instance of live connect session. In this case, in the appsdemo.cs. I am storing that. Okay. Now, what I want to do is I want to load in the images of the user. There we go. Load some data. So I have this session, which is a session object. Um, associated with the connection, with the connection with live. Whoops, I, I went too quick, sorry. Now I have to redo it. Let's, sorry for that, let's, let's redo it very quickly. I skipped the breakpoint and I had to stop it. Let's put another breakpoint over here. There we go. Very quickly. Okay. Okay. So I'm, I have now a live connection client and now on that client I'm going to do me albums. Give me back all the albums. That is going to return an album operation result of type uh, sorry, the dot result of that is of type dynamic. So you need to know, of course, what is available uh, in there. This is, however, available in the live SDK documentation. So now I'm going to loop through the albums that I have, which is again returning me a dynamic. For each item that I have, I'm going to get all the files that are in that album, as you can see here. And that is, a, um, so that way I'm going to loop through all the images, all the uh, files that are available inside of that um, um, album, inside of the SkyDrive of the user. There we go. As you can see, I have some images in here that it is returning me. Those are the images that are on the camera roll uh, on my uh, SkyDrive. As mentioned, it is not really that easy because of the fact that we need to do quite a lot of dynamic in here. Um, but it's very cool that we can integrate with the uh, with the live ID that the user has signed in with and integrate that inside of our applications. With that, um, we are going to skip the localization for now. We're going to do that next week. Um, so. Um, no summary, because we aren't there yet. The summary is only next week. Uh, so I think we can open it up for questions now, uh, if we have some, Svetla. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have a few questions already. I'm assigning them. Yeah, okay. Let's so take a look. In case some um, next specific details, uh, we can contact the um, person asking later on, because... Yeah, okay. Yeah, some, some questions must have. Can we start with the questions? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, okay. So I'm going to start at the very top. Um, 
<laughs> so uh, Mika asks here if it is possible to use tiles inside of the application. Um, I, I'm not sure if he really means tiles or uh, the update, uh, so the template XML. So the tile effect is not something that you can use inside of the application. The XML um, that, so for example, being returned from a, uh, a push notification is also not available within the application. I hope that answers the question. He seems to have left. Uh, it says so. Um, yeah, if if he wants to have some more information, simply send me an email. Um, he, uh, Evan or uh, is asking here. Uh, do you think data binding features that we are missing um, will be uh, added in time? That's a good question. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Let's hope. Um, However, it's it's not Silverlight, so I'm I'm not sure how they're going to do the updates of, of Windows 8. So I hope indeed that uh, that some of these will be uh, available uh, over time. Uh, another question here is um, from Evan: Is can you also have an upload operation? I assume that has to do with the background transfers. Uh, so indeed, background uh, can do both upload and uh, download. Um, this one is not really a question. We have had that one. Um, uh, so someone asks if semantic zoom can be used in combination with controls that are not a grid view or the list view. Um, as far as I know, it is not possible because everything that you can put inside of the semantic zoom has to implement the iSemantic zoom interface, and that is only the grid view and the list view. So it is not possible to do that. Um, with uh, with uh, semantic zoom, as far as I know, of course, if you want to place items in the individual elements, that is however possible. But it's not possible to load something else in here. Um, okay, let me delete the ones that we've already had. Uh, we'll skip that one. Um, so we've had that one. So um, Pavel asks, is it possible to do incremental loading with the grouped grid view? That is a good question. Um, um, I would have to think about that one. I haven't tried that really. Um, so I'm doing incremental loading with the grouped grid view. I would have to try it out. Um, can't really answer that one. I would have to try that out. It's a good question though. Um, I'm going to leave that one open. Uh, uh, so Larry asks here, is it possible to access a user contact photo with or without her permission? Uh, ideally you would have to ask them. Uh, as far as I know, it will always ask um, to do that. Uh, it's not doing it automatically um, to the single sign-on. You know who the user is, but it's always going to ask uh, before you can do stuff if the user is allowed to do that. It's going to show a warning. So that is done, if, uh, as far as I know, it is done by default. Um, someone asks if it is possible to use the Kinect SDK with Metro. As far as I know, the Kinect SDK is not compatible with Metro yet. Uh, I haven't played with it a lot, but a colleague of mine has, but I think it doesn't work with uh, Metro. Okay, so, so uh, yeah, no more questions. questions. No more questions okay. so far. So, no if questions. anyone has additional questions, uh, feel free to send them over to editorial at Silverlight and we'll address them to Jill. So, yeah, perfect. Thanks, Jill, for this presentation and thanks everyone for attending it. Um, feel free to leave any feedback on this webinar in our post webinar survey. You'll see it displayed right after you exit the webinar. And we welcome you to join part two of this webinar session next Wednesday at exactly the same time. You just need to register for uh, the session from the Civil Rights Show homepage. Okay. Thank you, Jill. Thanks, everyone, and You're have welcome. a good day. Good day. Bye. See you next week. Bye-bye.